Welcome everyone. My name is Rachel Izagiri with Plano Public Library and I want to thank you all for joining us for Plan and Plant for Pollinators with City of Plano's Sustainability and Environmental Education Division. Since you're all muted, if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat. We are monitoring the chat to assist you with any technical issues and collect questions. We will also be sure to leave time for questions at the end. Some housekeeping reminders that we want to share with everyone. This program is streaming on our YouTube channel and a recording will be available um, probably at the beginning of next week. Soliciting business or selling merchandise during library virtual programs is prohibited. So please show respect for our presenter and one another throughout the program. So when asked what she does for a living, Erin Hoffer quips that she gets paid to play in the dirt with worms and to encourage others to do the same as often as possible. She is delighted to combine her love of gardening and her love of education into a full-time vocation as an environmental educator and a part-time avocation as a master gardener and master composter volunteer. Erin Hoffer. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me today. Especially thank you for inviting me to talk about something that is so dear to my heart, which is pollinators. So as we uh, chat today, we're gonna talk about how to make your landscape more sustainable. So often when I'm talking with people, I want to know why do they want to plant for pollinators? It seems to be a growing trend in about the last five, six, seven years. And some of the answers that I get are that they want to um, uh, provide lost habitat uh, that's come about as uh, part of suburban development. Uh, a lot of it is that they enjoy watching uh, pollinators and listening to them in our garden. Uh, sometimes folks want to uh, help maintain native plant communities. So there's lots of great reasons for doing it. And I hope that by the end of today, you will have some ideas of how you too can plan and plant for pollinators. So I mentioned earlier um, the decreasing uh, habitat as a result of human uh, community expansion. So whenever we have an opportunity to replace those native meadows or those native areas that disappeared because we covered them over with buildings and schools and homes and landscapes that have maybe a different um, plantings in them, uh, it's a good thing for us to try to do it. And starting with your own yard is a very simple way to start restoring those habitats. And when we're looking at habitats, we try to take in mind or keep in mind who is going to be in that habitat and what needs does that creature or, as I tell children, nature neighbors, uh, what, what needs do they have? So we are always making sure that in the habitat we are providing for anything that we've taken away. And so we want to be sure that we include food and water and shelter and a place to raise the young. There we go. Let me see if I can get this to advance. There we go. One of the other things um, that we also talk about are what we call eco services. Every creature, every plant, every part of that habitat has an important role to play. And so when we uh, restore those habitats, we give a place for those important uh, creatures, particularly pollinators, to provide the service in that area. So in looking at some of our pollinators, one of the questions is, well, what are the services that they provide to us? Well, there's, uh, through the pollination, we have something that's called abiotic and biotic pollination. Uh, abiotic pollination means it doesn't have life involved in it. So those are non-living methods like wind and water that move the pollen from one part of the plant, uh, I'm sorry, from one flower on a plant over to uh, another flower on that same plant. Uh, in biotic pollination, uh, pollination, we have uh, involvement of life. And so that's usually somewhere in there the pollen gets moved with the assistance of birds, insects, animals of some kind. So for us as human beings, this matters because uh, something that you may not be aware of is that 90% of flowering plants depend on that biotic pollination. That means it depends on some sort of external creature to help that pollination along for those plants. And of those plants, over a hundred different 
different food crops depend on that biotic or animal assisted pollination. So a lot of the things that we eat every day and don't really think about depend on our pollinators. This is a typical landscape. And as you can see, it has minimal plant diversity. It's mostly lawn, which is just sort of a single crop. There's a few other uh, plants that are in there. They're not native. They're mostly ornamental. And really this landscape was in, created with the uh, intention of pleasing the human eye. However, when you begin to work with a sustainable landscape, you're perspective changes. And what you're looking for are a diversity of flowering native plants and plant species and communities that are going to make up a garden. And the reason for them being there is because that they are there to support wildlife. That's a much different approach to gardening than um, the typical conventional landscape. Another difference that you're going to find is that in a conventional landscape, we've done a very good job of teaching folks to cover the soil with mulch or plants because we have a goal of conserving water and reducing weeds. But unfortunately, it overlooks a very important function in a landscape. And that is leaving bare soil in small patches for nesting habitats and mud sources for some of our pollinator species like these um, eastern tiger swallowtails. They're, they're puddling right now. So in a sustainable landscape, we recognize that while it is important to conserve water and cover the ground, we do need to leave some bare places in the garden uh, so that they can uh, uh, provide for some of the needs of our nature neighbors. In a conventional landscape, often it's a very big lawn. The only time that we're concerned about water is keeping that lawn green or keeping the colored plants that are around green. And we rarely think about providing pools or dishes of drinking water for some of our nature friends. But in a sustainable landscape, when you move your landscaping goals in that direction, then you have intentional water sources provided for all kinds of creatures and the water is replenished on a regular basis. Nobody likes showering in a dirty bath and nobody likes drinking from a dirty fountain uh, and neither do our nature friends. So we make sure that we replace it on a regular basis. In the conventional landscape, I mentioned a little bit early, uh, earlier that uh, lawns are large expanses of uh, a single species of grass. They're highly maintained, they're highly irrigated often, and they're highly fertilized. So we spend a lot of time, energy, and money maintaining this big patch of green. Whereas a different approach in a sustainable landscape is that we reduce the lawn size. I'm not suggesting that we take it out completely but we diminish the amount of area that the, the lawn takes up. And um, we insert diverse plant species, things that are flowering ground covers or forbs that provide uh, that, that can provide nutrition as well as cover or, or nesting areas for some of our uh, nature friends. So when we adopt these principles, when we begin to change the way that we garden, one of the goals that we achieve is that we reduce what's called fragmentation. Once upon a time when creatures uh, roamed across the, the unpioneered areas, all of the wild spaces were connected and it was very easy for birds and uh, butterflies and larger creatures to move about. As we moved in and we began to chop them up in order for us to create cities and homes, those uh, wild spaces are no longer connected. And sometimes there are long miles in between. And that makes it a challenge for some of our uh, migrating neighbors, such as these uh, migrating monarchs. So when we began to create pollinator gardens, we began to re-knit together, reconnect together those wild places. And it's such a simple and easy thing for us to do. So let's talk a little bit about who is benefiting from the change in our behavior. And I want to talk a little bit about who's who 
in the garden. Often we think about bees and butterflies when somebody says pollinator, but there are many different kinds of pollinators. And I want you to pay attention to the ones that perhaps you've seen in your garden or the ones that you wish that you would see in your garden. And think about who might visit our garden and who, how do we attract them to the garden? Because what attracts one creature may or may not attract another. Uh, the good news is, is that often things that attract butterflies are also attractive to bees, and a few of those things are also attractive to hummingbirds. So speaking of bees, let's talk a little bit about our favorite um, workers in the garden. They are used so much in agriculture, and in fact, that they are critical for pollination of many crops. Um, if it's a fruit, vegetable, or a nut, somewhere in there, this non-native bee that was brought many, many years ago from Europe has uh, become part of our uh, habitat, part of our landscape, and an essential part of our agriculture. Because they are domesticated, uh, you may not know that there are more than 2 million colonies in the United States. And they are uh, placed on the back of a truck. They're, when I say they are worker bees, I truly mean they are workers because they can get shipped from state to state in time uh, for the blossoms of the next crop uh, to open up and they go out, take care of it. And then a couple of weeks later, they get packed up and they get moved again. So they contribute considerably uh, to our um, uh, agricultural industry. And I think they are the most familiar pollinator for us. Something that is a bee that is less uh, familiar to us are the native bees, and they are really the busy bees. Uh, there are so many different kinds of them. They are a little hairier than uh, a regular bee, and we call them the cupids of the garden because while they're buzzing from flower to flower collecting food, uh, they are facilitating plant reproduction. So they uh, are kind of unknown, which is really interesting given that there are more than 20,000 species of native bees. We have lots and lots of them here in Texas. I am quite sure you have seen them in the garden. You just didn't know that they were the native bees. If you want to support these sweet friends, then plant things that are have blossoms that are blue, white, and yellow. That is their favorite. They, they have the ability to see uh, ultraviolet light. And as a result, the way they look at things is different. And blue, white, and yellow shows up the best for them in the garden. Now, another bee that we see quite frequently, and I think it's probably one of my favorite, is the bumblebee. Those little fat guys out in the garden are considered the workaholics of the garden. They are often out and in the garden hunting for nectar long before the honeybees come out, uh, definitely before the butterflies get their wings warmed up. And they're frequently out even after uh, the honeybees have gone back to their hives and the sun is beginning to set. The thing that's very cool about them is that they are involved in so many uh, different parts of agriculture. In fact, if you like French fries, thank the bumblebee. They are the only known pollinator of potatoes worldwide, which I think is absolutely amazing. And if you have summer favorites like tomatoes and eggplants, melons, all of the berries, blackberries, blueberries, raspberries, strawberries, the bumblebee is one of the primary pollinators for that. So they are awesome little guys. Uh, they're kind of built like a Mack truck and they are built to bury a lot of cargo. One thing that a lot of folks don't know about them is they have a very long, what's called a proboscis, which is a tube that unfolds inside of which is their tongue. And they have a very, very long one. What I find very interesting in watching them is that often people uh, look at them and think, oh, the only way they're going to get any nectar is they're going to have to land on a big, wide, flat flower like the one that you see here. But because their tongue is so long, often they can reach into um, parts of the 
uh, plant where the nectar is way at the bottom that even the hummingbird can't get to. So the bumblebees are great at getting nectar in places that you would not expect, including flowers that have a trumpet-like shape. But I just love them. They're so sweet. They're um, relatively docile. Uh, the other thing that's very cool about them because they're fat, there are certain plants that uh, a snapdragon comes to mind. If you think about how a snapdragon is and it's closed up, but it has a little lip on the bottom and other creatures cannot get in there and get the nectar, but the fat old bumblebee can land on that pad and it pops those uh, snapdragon petals open. It quickly gets in there, gets the nectar, pops back off, snap goes the snapdragon and away goes the bumblebee. And I think that's a very cool thing to show children that those fat little bumblebees have special ways of getting at nectar that other creatures cannot. Now, some of you are looking at me going, I don't think I want this guy anywhere in my garden. But the reality is that wasps are really great pollinators. They're very high energy. They're very prolific. And here's the best part about them. In spite of their stinger, they are predators and they love things like aphids. So if you've got aphids and other garden pests, wasps are great to have around because they are the warriors who are going to take care of those uninvited pests. You just kind of have to keep your distance from them. I have to admit they're not very good pollinators. They're not very efficient pollinators because they have smooth bodies. And unlike the bees we were just talking about that have places on their legs and their pouches and they're furrier and there are places for the pollen to cling to them, um, they actually can pollinate, just not as efficiently. And if you happen to like figs, then thank a wasp because there's a very tiny wasp called a fig wasp and they uh, pollinate over 1000 species of figs. So if you like your fig newtons or just your plain figs, somewhere in there, there's a wasp helping you out. Now, I have to tell you that they do like the blue, white, and yellow flowers, but if you're not that fond of them, here's a tip, they don't like red. So plant a lot of red flowers, it'll attract other creatures, and maybe it'll help keep the wasps away just a little bit from your garden. Speaking of red, let's talk about our favorite flying divas of the garden and that those are the butterflies. Um, they're continually flitting from flower to flower, makes up for the fact that they only can move limited quantities of pollen, but they're very good at what they do. One of the things that I love uh, and find fascinating about butterflies as uh, pollinators is they can taste through their feet. So sometimes when you see a butterfly butterfly just kind of standing around on a plant, um, it's not that they're lost. The butterfly is tasting that plant to see if it's going to be okay as a host plant for their babies. Are the baby caterpillars going to enjoy eating this plant? Is this the best plant for the eggs to be laid on or should I move over to the next plant that tastes even better? When it comes to attracting butterflies, absolutely go to the bright side of the rainbow. Bright red and orange and purple are some of their favorites. That's not to say that they won't uh, stop at the whites and the yellows, but those are the ones that they go to first. There we go. Don't forget the night crew, the moths. And the moths are awesome because for the most part, they work while you sleep. Most of the moths are nocturnal, but occasionally there are some that are diurnal and you will see them out during the daytime. Um, the cool thing about this particular moth, this is a hawk moth. Uh, it's also known as a hummingbird moth because it's kind of about the same size of a lot of our hummingbirds, or you may know it as a sphinx moth. The cool thing about it, um, look at it, it is refueling in mid-flight. It is uh, getting nectar from this datura flower, which is a long white tubular flower. Those are the kind that they are attracted to most. Um, but they can, they, they don't have to land in order to uh, get what they need. Now, I will say that, yes, you can plant 
long white tubular flowers that are very, very fragrant. That is their favorite, but a little bit of a warning. Those moths have to come from some kind of a caterpillar. And some of you may recognize this little fellow here. This is a, a tobacco hornworm or sometimes known as a tomato hornworm. So if you want the moth, you're going to have to put up with the caterpillars that become the moths. But in order to save your garden, you might just pull some of them off the plant where they are eating and move them over to a select area where it's OK for them to eat those plants. But moths, as sometimes are not very pretty, but they are definitely essential part of a pollinator garden. I think this is another one of the most popular uh, creatures in the pollinator garden, which are our hummingbirds, and we call them the acrobats of the garden. The interesting thing about them is that they are only available in the Western Hemisphere. They migrate back and forth between us uh, in the north uh, uh, part of the hemisphere and then all the way down to Central and South America. Now, they are heavy drinkers of nectar. And uh, that's because they have a high metabolism. And so that means they are constantly out there seeking that uh, nectar that they need so much. Their feathers are the way that they move the pollen from plant to plant. And if you want to attract them, look for tubular uh, plants that have tubular flowers, particularly red, yellow, and orange. I will say though that I saw one time I was very surprised. I was thinking it was like a really big bumblebee and then realized it was actually a hummingbird that was drinking nectar from our uh, autumn sage and was drinking it from the purple flowers. And I, for all of these years, had thought red, yellow, and orange were the only options for hummingbirds. I was wrong. It is their preferred colors, but it is not the only colors that they will go drink at. Now, something that we don't often think about as a pollinator um, are beetles. And beetles are very prolific. In fact, they are the most numerous species of pollinators that we have. They are also the oldest known pollinator species. They have been doing it for millennia. Now, they are not guided by nectar. And in fact, they don't care about nectar at all. They are looking for pollen. They're what we call the mess and soil pollinators. Uh, they love things that are smelly. They like things that are spicy. They like things that are fermented smelling. It can be sweet smelling, but they are looking for smell because that pulls them to the uh, flower who wants to be pollinated saying, hey, baby, come on over here. I smell good. And then they, they know that they can pick up the pollen that they are searching for when they follow their uh, noses. They don't have a preference for color. They don't care what the flower shape is. So what they're really looking for is scent. And what an awesome opportunity for you to introduce into your garden some beautifully scented flowers that you too can enjoy, as well as the beetles. Now, you may not think of a fly as a pollinator. In fact, they're kind of the ugly guys in the garden, but they're very important in the ecosystem because they do pest control for us. They are also involved in, in orchards for certain types of fruits. And um, unfortunately, what attracts them is something that will probably repulse us. And they are looking for stinky, putrid um, smells that for uh, uh, pollination or for uh, hooking up and getting something to eat. So probably not your first choice, but don't be surprised if you do begin to see different types of flies show up in your garden as you expand what you plant for them. So I'm going to give you um, a moment or two to stop and jot down at least two types of pollinators that you think you might like to attract. Just make a note to yourself and kind of why you might be interested in them, because then that will help form uh, your plan for how you're going to make uh, the garden that you want for pollinators. So, uh, Rachel, do we have any pending questions at this point? As of right now, no questions. Okay, great. So I'm just going to power on ahead. 
So we're, one of the things that we um, mentioned at the top of the presentation is that we're going to plan and plant for pollinators. And on this lovely little marigold here, you are looking at a native bee. A lot of people would look at it and think that it was a honeybee, but it is indeed a native bee. And so there's probably a lot more out there than you actually realize are in your gardens. So if this is the goal to create something that is a pollinator uh, habitat, then the question becomes, how do we make that happen? The very first thing is for you to take a look at your time and resources and be very honest about the amount of time and resources you're willing to devote to developing a garden. I hope that by the time we come to the end of this presentation, uh, I will have given you some choices, some ideas that can be implemented quickly with very little time to get you started. But the amount of time is going to determine the amount of um, resources that you devote. Now, when we talk about adult food, that mostly applies to butterflies. You do need to supply uh, food. It's almost exclusively going to be to adults when it is a nectar source like these zinnias. Uh, but you want to make sure that all of what you are providing in the garden arcs across a period of time, across all of the seasons. So you have to ask yourself, who's coming to dinner? Um, which plants are going to give them that food, and then which season is that plant going to bloom in. And later on, I'm going to point out some resources that will help you to ensure that you get that for all of the seasons that um, we have blooms in. Now, if you do want butterflies, you are going to have to supply larva food. And I wish years ago, someone had explained to me the term host plant. They kept talking about nectar plants and host plants. And it didn't make any sense to me. Um, essentially, it's baby food. It is the plant is hosting or taking care of the caterpillar that will eventually become the butterfly that you desire to have in your garden. So you have to make sure that you've got the food that is specific to those caterpillars. In this case, I know that this is some type of milkweed because I have an upside down uh, monarch caterpillar munching away on the leaves. Another thing is to provide fresh water and keeping it clean. How are you going to keep it fresh on a regular basis? And I have some examples for you in a few moments. Uh, this one happens to be a fountain that is constantly moving, which keeps it fresh. And uh, it has flat areas where the bees can land and get a little bit of water for themselves. So it is actually quite easy to get fresh water. It's a little more of a challenge remembering to keep it clean. But if you're spending time in your garden every day, it's really not that much of a burden to change the water out every couple of days. Shelter, I think, is the one thing that we often overlook. Um, our friends need protection from predators. And so making sure that there is plenty of foliage and uh, access to the foliage as well as many different kinds of foliage will help to provide that shelter. And most often we want to choose plants that are native because they have evolved alongside the creatures that are living in that garden rather than bringing in non-native plants because sometimes they look beautiful but they don't support the wildlife including the insects and um, uh, birds that are coming to the gardens because they were never uh, developed. That wasn't, that wasn't part of how they evolved. An example would be a tawny emperor. Uh, not a very pretty butterfly, but I have come to appreciate them and their host plant for their babies, which is the hackberry. I don't know about you all, but hackberry is definitely not my favorite tree. It's not very pretty. It's kind of scraggly. The leaves always look kind of rough and beaten up. And worst of all, it has a terrible tendency to throw its seeds all over the place. So I'm constantly pulling hackberry babies out of the ground uh, throughout the growing season. 
But once I learned that it is a larva or a host plant for the larva of the tawny emperor, now I can see the value of the hackberry tree. The, its ecosystem service is to feed the native Texas butterflies, in this case, the tawny emperor. A monarch, I think we all know, and I mentioned earlier that one of the host plants or the host plant for uh, the monarch is milkweed. We have uh, seven milkweeds in the state of Texas that uh, support our migrating monarchs. Uh, this one happens to be a swamp milkweed, but antelope milkweed, green uh, milkweed, uh, sorry, antelope horn milkweed, uh, green milkweed, Texas milkweed, uh, even butterfly weed will help them uh, to support both the adults who need the nectar and the larvae that need the leaves. If you love gof fritillaries, you're going to have to plant some passion vine. It is the host plant for the larva that are, it is the uh, Gulf fritillaries. And I will tell you that we planted three passion vines, but we planted them a little later in the season. So by the time the Gulf fritillary, fritillary mamas showed up ready to lay eggs, they laid so many eggs, they ate our passion vine all the way down to the nub. So if you're going to plant passion vine, plant it now in the fall so that you've got plenty to host the Gulf fritillaries next year. Another beautiful butterfly that needs your support is the pipe vine swallowtail. And that means you're going to have to plant some sort of native pipe vine. Um, and how do you know that you have been successful and that they are here? Well, you can see that on this pipe vine, the butterfly has already laid her eggs. So one of the things to help you get started with selecting the types of plants and the ones that last throughout the year um, is a handout that we have included a link to. This one is put out by Texas Smartscape, and it uh, not only tells you the water usage of the plants, but the seasons of the plants that uh, uh, the flowers bloom. Now these happen to be specific to butterflies, but a lot of the bees enjoy them. We also have a bee list of plants that you can plant for blooming throughout the season. And some of them like um, um, the fragrant mist flower is something that butterflies enjoy as well. So the very nice thing about putting these plants in is often it will serve more than one type of creature. Um, in your garden. Now hummingbirds a little more specific and our sweet friend here is investigating a zinnia, but uh, he would also be super happy if you would put in a firecracker plant. So you might uh, know it as a kufia, sometimes people call it by its Latin name, but look at those long um, um, tubular red orange flowers definitely going to get the hummingbirds attention. Likewise, you probably already have Turk's cap and look at how that hummingbird gets its beak right into the twisted Turk's cap to get at the nectar. So we've included uh, in that packet a list of plants that hummingbirds love to have. And we certainly have in our uh, demonstration garden, I know we've got desert willow and Turk's cap. We do have some uh, flame acanthus, but in as I was looking at this, I realized that we might need to add some other things. Although I will say that the red yucca blooms from late spring all the way through summer into fall. So that is certainly uh, one of our main sources of nectar for the hummingbirds that visit us. Okay, quick check to see if anybody's got any pending questions, Rachel. None at this time. I didn't see any either, but sometimes things kind of flash by. All right, so let's talk about um, some other plans that we need to make. You'll notice this is a sweet little honeybee. And for many of us, those dandelions are something that we pull out of our lawn. Uh, I do try to leave them as much as possible, but once they start to uh, convert themselves into those little white puff balls, I get them out of the garden as quickly as possible. But as long as they are nectar sources, I'll let them hang out for a while because they do serve our honeybees and other creatures. I mentioned earlier leaving a place that is a bare soil patch, and it doesn't have to be very big, 
but it's very important for butterflies to have a puddling area, a part, a, a place that's a little bit damp where they can put their feet down, they can taste, see if it's what they need, and then they can take up some minerals um, and the only place that they can really get it is from rocks and from soil. So if you will leave a little bare patch, uh, then you will help them uh, with that uh, need. I love this uh, way of watering for bees, a, a shallow tray with marbles in it. If you don't have marbles, uh, if you've got small pebbles, that will work as well. But they just need a place that they can stand on so that they don't drown in the water. And um, it will make it a little bit difficult for uh, birds. <laughs> so this is really insect focused more than anything else when you put out uh, a watering hole that's like this or a watering tray. Now, most of us have downspouts, but most of us are, are probably not getting the maximum use out of the downspouts when it comes to our gardening friends, because we have um, the opportunity to create catchments at the bottom that have water that will last for a couple of days. That's not long enough for mosquitoes to get established, but it is enough for us to have short periods where there is water that insects can land on without uh, drowning and they can uh, hang out, cool off, get some water. And you can see that it's just some, um, pebbles of different sizes, some rocks of different sizes that have been placed in here. Now, this is a fancy one that someone made out of cement and a very large leaf. Yours doesn't have to be. It can be a very simple tray as long as it is relatively shallow and has places for the insects to perch. Uh, if you want to go the extra mile, this is a really fun thing to create with kids. It's called a butterfly puddling tray. You can use any sort of shallow saucer. It needs to have about one third wet sand, about one third small rock or pebble, uh, and about one third water. And then the big flat rocks that are there are great for sunning. So the butterflies can stand on the rocks and get water. Uh, the water also helps to hydrate the sand and the sand is where they're getting their minerals from and the flat rocks are where they can lie in the sun and warm their wings up. Uh, if sometimes you wonder why the butterflies aren't out as, uh, as early as some of our other pollinator friends like bees, it's because they've got their wings have to get uh, going. They have to get started at think kind of like how your car is on a cold winter morning. They've got to get those hydraulics working first. So flat rocks absorb uh, heat and release heat and it gives them a safe place to lie and get warmed up before they start jumping around in the garden and looking for nectar and places uh, to lay their eggs. Another really fun activity with kids is to create a sea pole. And you can see that our sweet friend here uh, has a bottle. It doesn't have to be a green bottle. It can be anything that is um, a bottle that you can poke a hole in. So there's very tiny holes at the bottom of the container. It'll take several hours for this to slowly a drop at a time, release the water. Uh, it will go across the flat rock. So again, because the rock remains moist, uh, insects can land on it, uh, safely get water, and then the remainder of the water drips down into a tray at the bottom. So creating a sea pole of some sort uh, can be a lot of fun. If I were doing it with children, I would give them the opportunity to decorate it, and I would give them the responsibility to check on it every day to see if we needed to add more water for our insect friends in the garden. Protecting our friends uh, from the elements is important. This is a, a photograph of a monarch chrysalis. And you can see that the monarch um, caterpillar has crawled from where it was munching on the milkweed someplace and crawled all the way over and up underneath the log to create its chrysalis to attach itself to the log. 
and eventually the butterfly will emerge. So leaving things in our yard um, that are natural items, um, such as logs and brush, small amount, doesn't have to be a lot, but what's what we call a wild area. And allowing for those gives our nature friends a place to be protected from the elements. Uh, in fact, uh, we had a couple of years ago, a place where uh, indoors, our uh, monarch butterflies were hiding from us, the predators, in a sense. I had all of our milkweed was in uh, pots, and the pots I had placed in a tray, and I brought them indoors to protect them from some things that were going on in the garden. And we knew that we had caterpillars and eggs on those um, milkweeds, and they began to hatch out right before our butterfly uh, public celebration. What happened though, between the celebration that was on a Saturday and Monday when I came in was many of our caterpillar friends had crawled out of their pots, uh, out of the main tray, down the side of the table and created their chrysalises up underneath the table and on some of the chairs that were in the room. So we had to relocate them, but they followed their natural instinct of getting away and hiding themselves from predators. So you can provide that for them by creating spaces in your garden that you allow to stay natural uh, so that they can use it. And then, of course, I mentioned earlier that plants are an excellent source of shelter. So something that is um, filled with different plant shapes, different plant heights, uh, lots of leaf coverage can help hide uh, our uh, pollinators, our birds and our insects from some of the predators, including sometimes curious human beings. So I want to encourage you as you start to make these changes to do small steps. Um, start simply. First and foremost, pay attention to your garden and educate yourself on what are the bloom times of the things that are in your garden and is every season represented? If it's not and you have a gap, begin to explore what plants do you have, could you get to put into your garden to bridge that gap? And look at how beautiful, what a beautiful rainbow this is. And this represents a lot of different plants that bloom at different times. When you have the opportunity to reduce your turf, say yes. Now, we don't recommend planting in the right of way, which is that gap between the sidewalk and the, the curb or the street, uh, simply because um, if you live on a corner, you can't have anything that's higher than 24 inches. Uh, also, if the city needs to access city services there, they might have to dig it up. But if this were the edge of your lawn right next to the sidewalk, this would be a great way to take out that monoculture turf and put in something that uh, blooms across the seasons, provides shelter, and provides food. I did mention a couple of times earlier about making sure that you provide that bare ground for them. And plan your maintenance. Um, often, especially in the summertime, we are up, we want to get out and get in the garden while it's cool. Uh, we'll do it before we go to work. And sometimes when we choose to do things out in the garden, it's at a time when our pollinators want to be out there too. So if it's going to be something that's really disruptive, um, wait, wait till later in the day when maybe it's too warm for your pollinators to be out. Um, the birds, the bees, the butterflies tend to come out uh, early in the morning and late in the uh, afternoon and into the early evening. So we have plenty of opportunities in between, but paying attention to when we do maintenance uh, will help us to not disrupt uh, any of the activity. Now, I have to admit when I'm out in the garden, my bee girlfriends are always out there and I'm just really careful about how I work around them. I'm not afraid of them. I know they're doing their job. They're not interested in me. I don't look like a flower. I don't smell like a flower. And as long as I'm not being aggressive towards them, they're perfectly happy to share the garden with me. But my wasp friends, not so much. So I tend to uh, be out when they are less likely to be out in the garden. 
I did mention the importance of uh, reducing pesticides earlier. Um, often our pesticides are related to our lawns and our desire to get rid of weeds. There's so many easier ways to take care of those things. Um, sometimes it's a seasonal thing. The weed will go away. Just mow over it or hand pull it. The amount of rain that we've had lately has made for wonderful weeding. Just get out there as soon as it's quit raining and yank those out of the, the ground. Skip the spray whenever you can. When it comes to choosing a spot, I want you to think small and I want you to rethink what is a garden. It can be a small patch of, patch of land like this one between your home and the sidewalk. It can also be something as simple as an alley. Most people wouldn't even think about putting plants here because of the shade. And yet, even these shade plants can provide food and shelter for uh, our pollinators. A patio is a great place. And often I have folks that live in apartments that say, oh, I can't do this because I just have a patio. Well, if you have a patio, you have space. If you have space, then you can create a place for pollinators. I love this pollinator pocket garden. It was a utilitarian side yard. It was mostly a pass through from the front yard to the backyard. You've got an air conditioner there. You're not going to want to hang out. And yet by choosing some native plants, look how beautiful they made the area and how useful to pollinator friends that they have made it. But it doesn't even have to be this big. Even an, a, a bucket can become a pollinator pocket. You just have to think about uh, what are the plants I can put in there? When are they going to bloom? And who are they going to help support? Even an old trash can can be a pollinator pocket garden. As long as you are providing something to eat, a place to be safe, and if at all possible, some water, then you have created the perfect paradise for the pollinators. A couple of last tips. Um, a lot of our pollinators are attracted by color and shape of flowers. So when you plant in masses rather than one or two plants, but lots of the same plant, it helps them to see what you have on offer and it helps them to uh, be attracted and driven to a particular area where you want to serve them. So varying the color, the texture, the height, but making sure you do it in large groupings will help to guide them to the right place where they can get what they need. And don't forget to be diverse, diverse in terms of shape of flower, color of flower, time of the bloom. And remember, if you want to have those butterflies, not only the nectar sources, which is the vast majority of the plants that we have, but also those specialized host plants that are going to feed the caterpillars for the butterflies that we want to invite in. So um, take a moment and I've given you lots of suggestions for ways that you can help our pollinator friends. So just stop down a couple to see, uh, to remind yourself of the ways that you might be able to help them. And I'm going to ask uh, Rachel if we've got any questions hanging out in the chat box. We do have a question. Uh, yeah. Andrea asks, is there a way to not attract gnats? That's a great question. Um, I will tell you that my experience with gnats has been they tend to love wet places. When we get them in our homes and sometimes when I get them in my container plants outside, it is an indicator of too much water. Now, I can't do a whole lot about the rain, but I can cut back on my own watering. So my first tip would be to take a um, moisture meter, put it down, and, and you can even use your finger as a moisture meter if you don't have a moisture meter. Uh, we do give them away uh, uh, at our uh, water and plant gardening events. So if you don't have one, uh, sign up, drop by for one of those, and we're happy to give you one. But put, uh, put your moisture meter down and see, is it moist? And if it's moist, stop watering. Wait till it gets a little closer to the dry side. And if it's wet, 
definitely don't water. So that may be able to help you. There are other ways to deal with them. There are things that you can uh, place in your container garden, uh, also around your pots. If I recall correctly, I think food grade diatomaceous earths is one of the things that we used when we had that problem with our indoor, not pool um, diatomaceous earth. That is, comp that is different. It's treated differently. Um, but food grade diatomaceous earth sometimes sprinkled around there uh, kind of helps because uh, it is uh, sharp and it will slice up their little bodies when they start hanging around there. Kind of sad for the plant, but or, or sorry, sad for the um, uh, insect, but happy for the plant. I, I hope, <laughs> I hope that is helpful for you. Do you have any more questions that are hanging out? All right, I've got a couple. That was our only one, yeah. Okay, so let me just, before we go, we've got a couple of minutes. I want to share with you some resources that I think will be very helpful for you. Uh, first and foremost, if you do not know wildflower.org, get acquainted. Uh, this is a um, excellent database that is the... Uh, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center in cooperation with UT. Um, they have, it started as a Texas only database many years ago. It has been so successful. It is now nationwide. So yay, Texas, we are providing services and guidance to folks all over the North America. But when you put things in uh, and you find uh, uh, flowers that uh, support a particular pollinator species that you want to attract, make sure that they are Texas appropriate. Another thing that is awesome is pollinator.org. And one of the things that we have attached comes from the pollinator partnership of the Wildflower Center and um, the Xerces Society and a couple of other uh, uh, organizations. They have created what are called um, planting guides. And this is a copy that we included. This is the Texas specific one. And it uh, gives you ideas of what to plant in a six by three area that is appropriate for your zip code. Now I put in the other day, 75093, which is kind of central Plano. So it's going to apply to all of Plano. And this is the only one for Texas. So if you download it, then um, share it with your friends. And you can see uh, that they've keyed it for spring, summer, and fall so that you constantly have something coming into flower to help support those friends. Texas Smartscape is another great database, keeping in mind that it has both uh, native plants as well as uh, what we call well-adapted plants, plants that have come out from elsewhere and uh, have been transported and have adapted well to our area. Uh, sometimes uh, they may not have a lot to offer in terms of food. Uh, sometimes they do, particularly in, in terms of like nectar, but they definitely are appropriate because maybe they are going to provide shelter for some of our uh, nature friends. So check them out. It is specific to North Central Texas. They do have a small section on Western Texas, but this is our area. It was developed for our area. Uh, we do have coming up the landscape tour. Uh, last year we went uh, virtual. So our home tour videos, we did uh, 59 to 12, maybe 15 minute long videos that are tours of the home gardens as well as interviews with the homeowners. This year we plan to go back live, but you can go to Plano.gov forward slash landscape tour. You can find out about the upcoming tour and you can see the videos uh, that we posted on YouTube for last year's uh, tour. We're very excited. We'll be uh, promoting it. We've got a shade garden. We've got, oh my goodness, there's, um, we have alternative places where they've taken out turf, vegetable gardening, all kinds of really fun, cool ideas. We tell folks, take your camera. It's from nine to three on uh, Saturday, October 23rd, more information will be coming. We also have Landscape for Life. So a lot of the principles that I've shared with you today, we have a five-week course that meets every Wednesday for two hours in the evening. 
uh, from September 29th to October 27th. And we'll be talking about ecosystems and the questions you need to ask yourself about how you want your sustainable landscape to be. We talk about plants and water, compost, soil health, um, pollinators. We spend one, one whole evening talking about pollinators. It's a really fun class. It's completely free. And we really uh, encourage you, if you're interested, plano.gov forward slash seed programs will get you to the registration website for all of our classes, whether they are webinars or they are in class now. Last year, this was a webinar. This year, we're going to go back to doing it live, but we've got a lot of other webinars that are available online related to gardening between now and December. And of course, I cannot um, skip referring one of the best resources that we have in this town. And the most awesome part about it is it is completely free to every resident. And that is our fabulous libraries. I love the libraries. I was so thrilled when we moved to Plano to find uh, the library resources. Uh, they are on shelf. They are online. We have wonderfully knowledgeable uh, librarians that can answer all kinds of questions that are related to gardening. So planolibrary.com is an excellent excellent place to get started, especially if this is your first time to join us for a library uh, webinar or meeting like we had today. Uh, and last, I want to offer our division, the Sustainability and Environmental Education Division, often known as SEED. If you have gardening questions, if you have questions about sustainability, we are here to serve you. You can always reach us at SEED at Plano.gov. I check the mailbox at least a couple of times every day. If we don't have the expertise, we are committed to connecting you to the people who do have the expertise. So I hope that this has been um, an opportunity for you to learn a little bit about gardening, a little bit about sustainability, and a little bit more about the pollinators. Um, are there any questions that we have left, Rachel? Yes, we got a couple questions. So Surely. Janet, Janet asked, how do I attract hummingbirds to my hummingbird feeder? Wow. Um, so you're asking me a really tough question because as a person who sustains or, or supports sustainable gardening, I almost want to tell you to take it down. Um, that's because we want them to have food that comes from nature. But the reality is those plants take time to grow. So first and foremost, um, patience, they have to find it. But if the only thing that's in your yard is that one little um, uh, red flower um, that is the fake flower that's there, they're not going to see it. So having other plants, even if they're not plants that are hummingbird friendly, having plants that are red will catch their attention when they are in the area. So that will help. Uh, changing out your hummingbird nectar on a regular basis will also help. By the way, you do not need to color it red. In fact, um, the experts say don't color it red. Let your bottle be red, let your plastic, whatever it is, be red to attract them. But change it out on a regular basis. It's one of the things I had to teach my mom. She was not changing it out every three to four days. It wasn't staying fresh. She would leave it in there for a week. And think about it. I mean, if you've ever opened up like a bag of chips and they've been there for a really long time, Time and they smell weird. Do you want to eat them? Well, it's kind of like that with hummingbirds as well. So you want to uh, put plants out that, that their color is going to attract them. If you can also select plants that will physically attract them because it's maybe a Turk's cap, which is super easy to grow. Um, also keep in mind that right now, it's full season and maybe your hummingbird friends are actually finding their uh, plant needs are being met in other places and they're not coming to you because their first choice is to go to um, what they know, the plants that they know, and less so to this kind of strange object that is hanging there. But 
I think if you begin to introduce red plants, if you begin to introduce hummingbird plants, and then you supplement your feeding with the hummingbird feeder, I, I'm hopeful that you will be a little more successful. If you want information, don't hesitate. Remember seed at planner.gov. Send me an email. I'll do a little more digging for you. And I'll look to see if I can come up with a, uh, a better answer than what I gave. All right, we had one more question. Sure. Are there are there any shade loving plants for pollinators or do most <laughs> of them need a lot of sun? So unfortunately, most of them do need a lot of sun, but I will tell you that Turk's cap is one of the few plants that is shade tolerant and attracts hummingbirds. Um, one that, uh, call, uh, what's it called? Hinkley's Columbine, also known as Texas Columbine, is a shade lover that has yellow blooms in the spring, and it attracts the Columbine dusky wing, and it is actually a host and nectar plant for that particular type of butterfly. Um, Greg's mist flower is good. It will tolerate up to a point. It will tolerate shade. Um, I might have to think about that one. If you don't mind sending me a, a quick email seed at plano.gov and say, Hey, what are those shade lover plants for the pollinators? And I will do a little more digging. Uh, I am mentally walking my way through our garden, through the shade garden area. And, um, those are the ones that immediately come to mind that I know are supportive of pollinators. But I'm, that's, that's a great question because we're a mature city. We have mature trees. That means we have a lot of shade. Uh, the one thing that I would tell you though is even if you have a shade garden, think about pollinator pocket um, containers that you might be able to put in an area that's a little bit sunnier and see if maybe that might be a little more successful. But yes, the reality is that a lot of them are sun lovers, not so much the shade lovers. Any other questions? Well, that was it, that was our last one. Super, just wanna remind you all um, that this is being brought to you by your wonderful folks at the Plano Libraries. Do stop by, if you haven't been by the library, do stop by online. Uh, they just have some excellent resources. And Rachel, thank you all so much for inviting me today. We appreciate you being here and sharing your expertise. You're so welcome.